I wanted to ask you about time management. Mm-hmm. You do so many things. I want to understand uh, for a younger audience, especially yeah. who keeps grappling that uh, you know time is always a constraint. Mm-hmm. I know that you did two degrees. Mm-hmm. Uh, you got inside the prestigious Jerome Fisher program, which is mm-hmm. actually one of the things I want to speak about a little later. Yeah. But how do you manage it? Because you're running a very large enterprise also now. Yeah. It's a really good question, I think. And, you know, ironically, in so many podcasts, no one's asked me this question. Especially now, because between being a mother and a, you know, CEO and, you know, I don't live life just as family and CEO. I, you know, I also have a World Economic Forum still going on. I'm vice chairman of Amphi. There are 10 projects I'm doing at any point in time. So I think time management is super important. One is I believe that most people have more time than they think they yeah. do. So, you know, when people talk to me about social media and they're like, how, much, how do you have so much time? I'm like, yeah, I watch one less episode of Bombay Bay comes on Netflix. The second thing is, I think it is important to have priorities. So I have very clear priorities. You know, for me, there is my work, there is my home, and there is a third space in life where I call personal growth. And I take on projects on that. So yeah. it could be Amphi Vice Chairmanship, it could be my book. And I, I actually live by a spreadsheet. So I have a spreadsheet where I list down personal priorities for the year and for the week. And I look at that spreadsheet every week. And then I just relentlessly say no to everything else. Yeah. And third is, you know, one of the things that is good for me is that I've learned to become reasonably efficient. I think people underestimate, you know, how quickly you can get things done. There is so much help when you try to delegate. There is so much help by way of productivity tools, high chat GPT. Yeah. You know, there's so much that you can do to be efficient. So I try to take decisions quickly and I try to be very efficient. I'm told I'm very fast with things. But that's the only way to get so many things done. We still end up getting a lot of personal time as well. I get a lot of personal time. You know, people will be surprised with the amount of time I spend with my son. I remember I was shopping in Ikea once. This is such a funny story. And I was with my uh, baby nurse and while I was picking the pill someone actually came up to her and they're like so we've seen her on LinkedIn etc and it's such a weird question to us they're like does she actually spend time with her kid now <laughs> who asks that I don't <laughs> but I do I get a tremendous amount of personal time most people don't know that I talk to my parents every night for half an hour a night oh, wow. and it's something I've been doing for years and years and I think it's energizing right you know when you come home after a long day You've made tough decisions, there is stress, there's all all the stuff that happens in the office. But when you go home and you just see your smiling one-year-old with his toothy grin doing something silly, you don't get emotional about things at office. And you come back to office charged up, you can take stress, but it doesn't emotionally hit you because there's another outlet. So I think it's very important. So for all the kids who are thinking that they don't have two hours of studying in a day, uh, she's doing a billion things. Please do take some inspiration. Put a spreadsheet, calculate your 24 hours. I think you, I'm sure you'll get two hours to study. You know, my mother used to make these sheets for me. There were yeah. no spreadsheets back in yeah, our time. Yeah. I know I sound really old, but like I think since I was in seventh grade, because again, I was doing so much, after I would come home from school, she would make these sheets and put it on my wall saying that these are the projects that are due in the next two weeks. This is today we'll work on this one, then wow. we'll work on that one. And so there was never any problem of deadlines. Because deadlines, I, I don't like. Deadlines stress me. They annoy yeah. me. So she would make this and plan it. And I think I continued that. So I want to also ask you about the early years at Wharton. Mm-hmm. You did uh, two degrees over there. Yeah. You got inside the prestigious Jerome Fisher program. You and Nadin both. First of all, getting in that program, 60 or 60-odd 60 kids in the world get inside that program. You also mentioned that you got inside Yale. So can you tell us a little bit about how you prepped? Mm-hmm. And you got a 95% financial aid as well. Yeah, I did. I did. Now... You know, I have seen college admissions, uh, especially because of my husband, Nalin, uh, much more closely now. He's helmed admissions for uh, India for Penn for many years. I've interviewed candidates and I went back to campus this time to receive an alumni award at, at Fisher. So I've seen kids today and I see myself and I have to say I was a very clueless kid then. In my time, the fact that I could even apply and study abroad. I mean, I was the first one from the family. So for me, this was really shooting the moon. I learned about the Fisher program and I said this in my award speech through an application form. Yeah. Today, everybody knows about the yeah. Fisher program and everything. And they're prepped and they know what school they want to go to and what colleges and essays. And they look so smart and they look so perfect and they look so curated. Like I was pretty clueless uh, back then. 
and it was really my mother and me on a mission. Yeah. Um, and I, I remember applying to 14 colleges, which was a lot yeah. uh, at that point in time because I was a financial aid applicant. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, Ivy League schools give very limited financial aid to overseas students. I was fortunate enough to get into the schools. I have realized with college applications, you know, today they're over curated. Yeah. I would almost say that. It's like the kids are perfect. They don't sound like 17 and 18 year olds. <laughs> And I think what worked for us then is we were authentic. Yeah. Uh, and that's what I tell every applicant to an Ivy League school that, of course, you have to be a damn good student. Of course, you have to work hard on those essays. But there's a certain amount of authenticity that needs to come. If you don't enjoy doing social work, don't do it to tick the yeah, box. Yeah, it yeah. shows people can see it's through only, this. Yeah, yeah. You know, there was once an application we read where a 17-year-old said, I am a hedge fund manager who's wow. generated 65% returns a year for the last five years. There was someone who was applying, who tried to disprove Pythagoras' theorem. <laughs> and, you know, his alumni interview ended up being someone who was a professor at ma of math. Mad. <laughs> so I think a little bit of authenticity in the college application does well. Um, and I think that that's, that's what worked. Um, my early years at Penn, I think, if, if that was your question, were fantastic. An Ivy League school or a school of that caliber is a new world, especially if you have not been exposed to that. I think the classes are great, but what is greater is the environment. You just meet with students of that caliber. And your ambition level no, automatically goes from here to here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You start thinking of working with the best in the world, studying with the best in the world. And I think that confidence stays with you for much longer no. than any part of the education does.